Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining the introduction to IBM Cognos Dynamics Cube's webinar. My name is Kristen Brown, and I'm the Marketing and Events Manager for the Ironside Group. I'm going to take a few minutes and introduce you to today's presenters and um, some additional information. Leading today's presentation will be Mike Vollmer, who is a senior BI consultant for the Ironside Group, and Francois Ross, who is a regional VP with Ironside. Uh, we ask if you want to join today's discussion live on Twitter, you can use hashtag dynamic cubes to join the discussion. And if you have any questions today during the discussion, please enter your questions into the chat panel on, the, uh, on your window on your main screen, and we will answer all questions at the end of the presentation. And lastly, here are a list of some of our upcoming events over the next month. If you're interested in attending any of these events, you can visit our website, ironsidegroup.com. And also, if you are in the Atlanta area and like to attend a Dynamic Cubes hands-on workshop, we are hosting one at IBM's facilities on April 8th. And uh, for additional information on that or to register, you can go to our website as well. I'm going to hand this over now to Francois Ross. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Francois Ross. I'm Regional Vice President for the Ironside Group. Um, just a bit about us. So we've been, um, we've been out there for about 15 years, uh, initially focused on the, you know, delivering business analytic solution with the IBM Cognos um, platform. So we've been a legacy partner prior to the IBM acquisition of Cognos, which is already a few years ago now. And you know we've been uh, dedicating our, our, our focus, our career, and, and our people uh, towards delivering the best of breed. Uh, you know, accelerations. We we like to we, we can be you know we can be your partner for soup to nut engagement or deployment. Uh, we can also help you with some mentoring services, training, anything you need to make sure that you are on the right track to deploy a you know a, a growing solution leveraging the capabilities of the platform and all the different components around the IBM business analytic platform. So for, for those, you know, all of us, in a, lot of, a lot of those in this call also have invested uh, their career into, into business analytics. Uh, and and it's, it's probably fair to say that we all agree the platform has evolved tremendously. They're very mature now. A lot of vendors out there, you guys have invested into the IBM Cognos platform, for example, and, and there's a lot of functional, functionality out there. One thing we can agree on is um, the end user has pretty much raised, you know, they raised the bar on their expectation. A lot of vendors have also changed the game in delivering um, you know, what we call the next shiny object, um, nice charts. and and giving the perception that you know the users are empowered to really uh, access the data in a very predictive response time. Um, not that it was not a promise that we were making back in the days when business intelligence was first introduced, but now it really feels that it's possible and, and users are really perceive this as, you know, just get it done and, and they feel that we can definitely deploy a solution that will give them what they want and empower them to do what they want with the data. Um, a good analogy is the, you know, for example, when, you, you were, when you're on Google and you, and you um, Google a search or you know, any Google query, you actually get the, you get the answers sometimes before you even finish typing. I mean, it's just an analogy that shows you how users are empowered and, and the game has changed. Uh, the data is more and more complex, more segmented, there's a lot more details in the data, so the detail in the data is important. You know, we 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 definitely need uh, uh, to make decision on on summaries, roll up, and trends. But in a lot of industries, the you know the the devil is in the detail of that data. So it's important that we can deliver um, the data and the assets in such a way where the users can really make decisions on any you know on any which which way they want, whether they want to do self-service ad hoc or, or be able to drill down to detail in the predictive response time. So that introduces the, uh, the component that we're going to be talking about today, uh, the dynamic cube. So with me, Michael Vollmer, I've worked with Mike for over 10 years, and Mike has been one of our um, most senior resources as it relates to experience in this space. Um, and he's going to be showing you some of the fundamentals behind 
the dynamic cubes and things you need to know. And uh, of course, uh, hopefully, we'll have enough questions to help you uh, take away from, from this uh, presentation a lot of knowledge and be able to apply those practices moving forward. So Michael, um, I will leave this to you. Thank you, Francois and Chris, for the introduction. Um, hello to everyone on the call. So you guys have all heard a lot about dynamic cubes. But really, what is dynamic cubes? Basically, dynamic cubes is an OLAP solution that extends the existing dynamic query mode on your current BI servers. So again, just repeat that. It uses your current BI servers that you already have in place. Dynamic cubes leverage the, ca the caching capabilities of dynamic query mode to provide high-performance analytics over large volumes of data. Dynamic cubes are also aggregate aware, meaning that it can leverage and use your existing aggregate tables in your data warehouse. Again, dynamic cubes can provide high performance over high volumes of data. Um, it does this by using a combination of optimized, uh, this is by a combination of optimized pre-aggregates using in-memory aggregation and in-database aggregation. And we'll talk about both of those in the next coming slide. A couple of caveats before you build your dynamic cube, as you should know. And one of that is that your data mark should be a star or snowflake schema already in place. It is not recommended to build a dynamic cube against a transactional system. Dynamic cubes also have very limited capabilities for compensating for bad data. It is highly recommended that before you start to build your dynamic cube that you have a mature data mark already in place. And again, dynamic cubes leverage the existing dynamic query mode. So your existing BI servers must have large amounts of memory and horsepower if you want to take full advantage of the new dynamic cube technology. So just a quick diagram of dynamic cubes. We can see that it has extensive caching capabilities. Um, again, it's going to use your dynamic query mode on your servers. One of the things to note is that there is no additional software to install for dynamic cubes. If you want to leverage that in your environment, it will use your existing dynamic or you're using Cosmos BI servers, dynamic cubes reside inside of the actual dynamic query mode engine. So again, just another diagram how this interacts with your current environment. I, again, there's like no new software. Dynamic cubes basically uh, require require nothing additional to installed on your servers and they can leverage be leveraged by your current BI server hardware in place. Uh, some, some interesting things to note about Dynamic Cubes is it uses existing Cognitive Studios, such as Workspace Advanced, Report Studio, Analysis Studio, etc. Um, there are no new studios for Dynamic Cubes. And to your users, it's just going to look and feel like any other cube in your environment. You're also going to want to use a 64-bit server. Your Dynamic Cubes are only limited by the amount of RAM that are on your server. So having a 64-bit server is going to give you the capabilities to have a a very large dynamic cube in memory. And I think one of the most important things about dynamic cubes is there's really no limit to the level of detail that you can put in your dynamic cube. You can actually put in SKU number, policy number, UPC, very low levels of granularity into a dynamic cube. And it performs beautifully. The key to this is actually using the aggregate advisor. It's an optional component of dynamic cubes, but you should always use, I think, as you keep as Key success with delivery of dynamic cubes is going to be the aggregate advisor to set the defined level of caching. We're going to cover aggregate advisor later on in the slides, but again, I want to make sure we've noted that a successful implementation is always going to be if you use the aggregate advisor on your dynamic cubes after you deploy them. So here we have a, a simple workflow of how a dynamic cube is built and how, how it works. So we're going to start off with this client tool called Cube Designer. Um, basically, that is a metadata modeling tool for for, mod for modeling your dynamic cube. You're going to publish your dynamic cube definition to your Cognos BI server, and that's going to reside in, in your dynamic query mode components. And once that's been published, step two and three, we're actually going to go in and we're going to start and stop our cube. We're going to manage the memory settings for that cube. And then finally, step four, really the final step here, is you're going to release your cube to your environment. And those are going to be consumed by your users using the existing Cognos Studios. And step five, again, is the optional component here, but I think it's the most important. It's the actual true optimization of dynamic cubes. That is going to be done through the aggregate advisor tool, which we're going to go through in detail later on. But again,
again, I think step five is the most important that people tend to skip, and that's the actual true optimization and caching of your dynamic view. So a couple components of dynamic cubes you should be familiar with. The first one is the dynamic cube designer. It is a client tool similar to framework manager. Um, it can be installed anywhere in your environment. It, is, it basically is the component of dynamic cube as far as modeling the cube itself. And here you'll define your cube, you'll define your measures, you'll define your dimensions and things like that to get your data marked. Once your cube has been built, once your cube definition, excuse me, has been built, you're actually going to publish that to Cognos BI. And that actually is going to reside in Cognos in the Cognos content store. And you can access that through the Cognos IBM administration screen in Cognos BI by clicking on the status tab and clicking on data stores. And you'll see a list of all your dynamic cubes that are available to you. And this screen here, you'll be able to basically start and stop your cubes, monitor the memory setting, and make adjustments as needed. And we're going to go through these, um, these steps in the next few minutes. And lastly, again, is the aggregate advisor. Again, this is an optional tool. Um, it's not required to implement your dynamic cube in, initially, but it's something you should do after you've already published your dynamic cube. It's recommended that you run aggregate advisor against your dynamic cube to provide in-memory caching recommendations, which will make optimize and speed up your performance of your dynamic cube. Okay. All right, so we are. Um, Moving along here, we are ready for a, just a quick Dynamic Cubes demo. A couple things that I'd like to point out as we get to this demo is that it looks and feels like any other cube that we have in the environment. We're going to use the existing studios that are already in place for our Dynamic Cube. I'm going to show you how to um, stop and start the cube. I'm also going to go through how to monitor some different statistics around your Dynamic Cube and maybe change some of the existing memory settings. And then we'll start off with the Dynamic Cube designer and we'll actually build a Dynamic Cube from scratch. I'm going to exit my PowerPoint presentation here, and we're going to actually open up my Cognos BI environment. Okay. So again, the Cognos BI environment, I have my um, I have a sample dynamic cube out here that I've already created it's called Cells Test Dynamic Cube. As I can see, it's already a package. Um, it doesn't have any special icons. It looks just like any other package that's out there. From a user standpoint, they're not going to know it's a dynamic cube. So we're going to launch. Uh, we'll start off with Analysis Studio. Give it a second to load. And so as I see, I have a standard cube in place. I look at my dimensions. They look and feel just like any other dynamic or any other cube that we've already had on our Power Player TM1. So I'm going to load. I'm going to drag over my dimensions over here to my rows and columns. Drag in any measure. So, again, dynamic cubes. They're just they're going to function similar to any other cube that you already have. Again, from a user standpoint, they look and feel very similar to what they've already known or what they have in the past. Okay, I'm going to close my uh, my window here. Okay. So let's look at some of the administration settings on dynamic cubes. So we're going to go through some of the administration pieces of dynamic cubes. Uh, what I want to point out here is some of the basic components of it, uh, how to handle some of the memory settings, and also how to uh, how to stop and start your dynamic cube. So we're going to launch the Cognos administration screen. Log on, excuse me. All right, so here is the standard Cognos IBM administration. Um, we're looking at the status tab, and if we click on data stores, I will actually see a list of all the dynamic cubes that are available to me. So these are my current dynamic cubes that I have published to my server. Um, we were sales test is the server is the cube that we were just looking at. So a couple things we're going to note here is um, this is where you're going to be able to stop and start your cube. And we're going to go through this a few more times, but 
want to go through some of these basic settings for dynamic cubes to point out how to access these from an administration standpoint. So again, we're, we're on the data store tab. If I look, here's where I can stop and start my cube. I can also refresh my cube data. Um, again, as time goes on, your cube is in memory. Obviously, your data mark, your data rounds are going to change on a fairly frequently basis. So this is going to give us the ability to go in and refresh my cube. It's also going to give me a, uh, the ability to look at some of the recent messages. And that's going to tell me certain things as how long it takes to start my queue, where's the last time it's been restarted, things like that. I have a nice uh, metrics window over here on the right, which tells me certain things as how much I'm hitting my data cache, uh, how many members I have in my mem in memory, and basically how large my dynamic cube currently is. If I want to stop or start a dynamic cube, simple enough. The drop down and stop immediately. As such, we can start it out. Such. So, when you publish your dynamic cube, again, it's actually going to reside in your Cognos BI server. Now, we're going to walk through the steps of creating an actual cube definition here in a few minutes. But it's important to understand that your actual dynamic cube itself is actually going to load on your Cognos BI servers. And as you can see in this case, this is loaded on my, uh, my local machine. Now, when you publish your dynamic cubes, they do show up as data sources. But if I look at my, my configuration tab under data sources, I can see that I actually have three dynamic cubes already in place that are out there. Um, my cells and my cells tests and my all payments cube. Dynamic cubes are going to have special icons and denote that they're dynamic cubes and the data source. These data sources can be pulled in the front of a manager just like any other data source, um, you know, similar to current PM1 or power plant. Okay. So we're going to launch the, uh, the basic client tool for dynamic cubes for modeling your dynamic cube initially. Um, and then we're actually going to publish a brand new dynamic cube to my Cognos BI server. And we should see that that, that new dynamic cube is going to show up under the data stores. So if you look, there is a, a client component that is additional. It is required, but it's not part of the actual server itself. It's called IBM Cognos Cube Designer. Again, Cube Designer is going to be very similar to Framework Manager in the fact that it's a metadata modeling tool. And then just like Framework Manager, you actually have to publish a object back to Cognos BI. And in this case, we're actually going to publish a cube definition back to BI. We are not going to actually load a cube from um, Cube Designer. This is simply just a modeling tool for the Cube Designer definition. The actual loading of the cube itself will happen on the Cognos BI server when you stop and start the cube. Again, we have uh, the initial screen here. Kind of gives us a two-step, or three-step approach here. We're going to pull metadata, model the cube, and publish. So we're going to go through this in detail. But uh, first thing we're going to do is simply just create a new model. Now the model, when you a brand new model, initially it's going to be very simple. There's not much here. First key thing you're going to want to do is you're going to have to pull in metadata for your dynamic cube. Now this is important. It's going to leverage your existing data source connections in Cognos BI, but it does not actually leverage any metadata that's currently in your BI environment, and as such as Framework Manager packages. You are going to have to model your dynamic cube from scratch. just log in here to my BI environment. So these are my current existing dynamic, uh, my, sorry, my existing data source connections. A couple of things to point out here is because dynamic cube extends and leverages dynamic query mode, you must already have enabled the actual JDBC drivers for your relational source. So again, the, the dynamic cube mode must already be turned on for the data sources for your dynamic cube. So in this case, I'm using the SQL Server. I have a very simplistic data set called cells test, which is currently using dynamic query mode as my source, and everything is in my DBL schema. Okay. I'm going to open up our basic model. Um, on my left side of the screen, I'm going to see a list of my metadata. 
So again, this is a very simple database. It has just a handful of tables in here for us to use. Um, but basically, this is a mirror image of my current data warehouse. There are no joins to find um, whatsoever between the tables. That's what we're going to do initially in our model here. But it simply is our initial import of metadata from my operational database. In the middle section is our Project Explorer. This is actually going to be the screen where we're actually going to create our dimensions. Uh, we're going to create the levels for our dimensions, and we're also going to create the cube itself. And on the right side of the screen is our Properties window. So as we click on different objects in our cube or in our model, we're actually going to have a Properties window here on the right. And that window is, going to, is where we're going to be able to make certain changes, like renaming dimensions and adding new values to those dimensions. Okay. So right off the bat, first thing we're going to do is create a simple dimension. Um, if you've worked with TM1 in the past, dynamic, uh, or sorry, cube design is very similar to TM1. You're going to create your dimensions initially independently of your cube. Um, this is unlike power play. With power play, normally what we do is you, your cube and your, and your model itself, all the dimensions are not shared across cubes. Whereas in this case, we are going to create multiple dimensions, which then later can be shared across multiple cubes. So we're going to start off. I'm going to look at my, my data source connection here. And I see that I have a location dimension. And we're just going to keep it very simple for this demo. We're just going to call this my location dimension. So I'm going to double click on that. And when I double click on my dimension, I can now see I have some properties for that dimension. Well, one of the things we're going to notice is that I have a list of levels. Now by default, it's going to create a new level for us. It's just simply going to be called new level. Now I'm going to expand my metadata over here to look at my, my very simple dimension tree here. And I can see that I want a level for region and another level for state. So we're going to take this first level and we're going to rename that to be region. Now we're going to repeat this quite a few times, so um, you know maybe going a little quick here, but we're going to go over this quite a few more times for the other dimensions as we go through this. So we have the first level called region, and now we want to add an additional level. Um, simple enough. We're just going to add another level, and this level is going to be called state. At this point, we've not actually mapped any data to our levels or to our dimension. There is no connection back to my database at this point. We have simply just designed the actual structure of the dimension itself. So now what we need to do is we actually need to map data from our physical database to our different levels. So we're going to double click on region. And usually double clicking is the way to go in your cube designer. When you double click on something, that's going to basically put it in context in the property window. So we're going to take region, simple enough, and we're just going to drag region over into my, uh, my region level window here. Now, I, again, have a very simple model. So we're going to use region value as the caption. We're also going to find that as the key. So there are only two requirements for the attributes of your levels, and that's going to be the member caption and the member key, the level unique key. So each level that you have will have a, an option for caption and an option for the key. So generally speaking, the keys and the captions will not always be the same. But again, I have a very simple data set, and we're going to, that's going to be the case for us. We're going to double click on state. Same thing. We're going to drag my state column from my database over to the window on the right. We're going to add that as the caption. We're also going to make it the key. And I can see there's a mapping window here. If I hover over that, I should be able to see that it actually is pointing to my physical database, which is location underscore D dot state. This is my uh, physical column, my table here. Okay. So I have my location dimension. I have two levels. I also have a default hierarchy called new hierarchy. Um, by default, every hierarchy, by default, every dimension is going to have at least one hierarchy. If you have multiple hierarchies or alternate hierarchies, for example, you can also define those here. In this case, we don't have the data to support that, but you can define as many hierarchies as you want. So we're going to actually rename this to be location, excuse me, location underscore h. And I can see by, by default, location underscore H has my two levels of region and state. And now that I've already added data to it and I'm mapping my metadata, I can actually expand the members folder here. And I can actually see my initial hierarchy, which comes from my data warehouse here, which is my, my regions and then my state under my region. Okay, Collapse this. And that is my first dimension. It is done. And we're going to repeat this a couple more times for the other dimensions that are here, and then we're going to build a cube. 
So again, we're going to click on the model namespace. You can either right click and say new dimension, or you can use the toolbar at the top. Really, it's the same exact um, methodology here. It's just user preference. So again, there's an icon up here. We're going to right click. We're going to create a new dimension. And this new dimension is going to be called product. Simple enough. Again, we're going to double click on product. We're going to see that product has a, a default level called new level, and it has a default hierarchy called new hierarchy. So we're going to highlight new level. We're going to call that, if you look at my, my table here, and we're going to call that product line. OK. And we're going to add one more level to my, um, my dimension here. So we have product line. We're going to add one more level. We're going to call that, simple enough, product. So if you look, I have two levels, product line and product. Right now, there's actually no data mapped to my product with my different levels. And we're just simply just going to drag over the metadata from my left side of the screen from my database into the properties window here. So again, I'm looking at product line level. I have a product line data value. We're going to set that as a caption and also as the uh, memory of the key. Same thing for product. We're going to click on product. We're going to drag over the product. So that is the default caption and also the default unique key. We're going to rename the uh, hierarchy here to be just simple product hierarchy. Slide H. Again, I can look and look at the members of my tree. I can see my initial product, which is, again, very simplistic. We have air, we have land, and there are different products associated with those, uh, those product lines. Looks like we have um, two more. Um, Two more dimensions we're going to create. Cells are up in time, and we're just going to quickly go through that. So we're going to create a new dimension. We're going to call this cells. Cells are up. Expand that. Take that, and that's going to be called manager. Hit OK. And we're going to create. Um, Another level called cells rep. Okay. Again, simple enough. We have two levels. We're going to map the data to those levels as such. Hit OK. Hit OK. And we're going to do the same thing for cells rep. Now, I want to point out if you forget the, if you miss a step or you miss an option to check one of these values here. It will actually catch that. So if you look right now, there's an actual red icon on my level. And it actually tells me there's a problem. I click on my issues, it says I have one issue. In this case, I have a level called cells row, but I do not have any keys associated to that. So again, if you see the little red icon, basically look on the issues um, tab here, and it will tell you what the problem is. In this case, we obviously did select a unique key for that level. OK, we're going to go ahead and save this real quick. We'll just save it to my. Uh, my desktop here. We'll just call it test. So again, if you saw that, it's kind of quick, but the, um, the Cube Designer saves a model similar to Framework Manager and has an FMD extension to it. So at this point, we actually have done nothing to Cognos BI. There's no Cube in Cognos, um, in Cognos BI server. We have just created a simple definition of our Cube itself. So we're going to make this to enough. And we're going to create our last and final dimension, and that's going to be called time. OK, a couple of caveats about time. <clears throat> Unlike Transformer, Dynamic Cubes does not have an uh, out-of-the-box solution for relative time. It is highly recommended that you have a true time dimension table in your existing data part. So in this case, I look at my time dimension table. I have a table that has year, month, and day. You should already have that in place before you build your Dynamic Cube. Um, you can leverage that. You can basically recreate a time dimension on the fly using certain functions. But it's best and it's mostly recommended that you actually already have a true time dimension table in place beforehand. So in this case, we're going to create three levels, uh, year, month, and day. So we're going to take the first one as default. We're going to rename it the year. And 
create two more. Call that one. Call this one one. And then the last one's going to be called day. Again, double click on the uh, year level, and we're just going to map the metadata from our database into the level itself. Again, we're going to set the caption. We're going to set the default uh, caption and the key for each level. There we go. Now, our dimensions are right now, we're currently we're using a, uh, a standard star schema here, but if for some reason you did have to do a snowflake schema, you would actually end up having levels from different database tables. If that was the case, you would see a option here for implementation. Implementation is basically going to show us a, all the tables that are involved with each dimension. So we're now looking at time, it on sales rep, looking at implementation. I can also see there's a sales rep table in there. If I had multiple tables that are involved to create this dimension, again, for a snowflake schema, you would be able to define the joins between the two by using this tab. So got our dimensions in place, simple enough. And now we're going to actually create the queue. So just like the dimensions, we're going to right click on the model and say create queue. So we're going to call this my cells DC dynamic queue. Okay, simple enough. We just created our first queue. Now we have no dimensions associated to that queue, nor do we have any measures. But we're simply just like the way we create our dimensions. We're going to drag and drop our metadata over from the right. The left side of the screen. So if I look at this, I have a simple table called sales fact. So sales fact has two measures, sales amount and quantity. So I'm going to double click on my measures folder here under my queue because these are measures and this is where I want them to go. We're going to drag over sales amount. Same thing, we're going to drag over sales quantity. So now my queue has two measures, sales amount and quantity. But I still don't have any dimensions on my queue. And those are easy to add. So we're just going to double click on my uh, cube again. And I see that I'm now looking at my list of dimensions, which are empty. And for this cube, we want to add in, let's say, location. We're going to add in products. We're going to add in sales rep. We're going to add in time. So I'm simply enough, I've got my existing dimensions. I'm just adding them to my cube. Now at this point, the question is, OK, how do I make the relationships between my fact table and my dimension table? Simple enough, if I'm looking at my dimensions here, I see the option to relationship. I can click on edit. So I'm going to click on edit. And I can see by default the names are the same for the columns. So on my dimension for location, I click the drop down. I can see that it comes out of my location underscore D table. I have, a ta I have a column called state. That actually is going to be measured or mapped to my state column out of my cells fact table. It's key if the names of the columns are exactly the same. The good news is dynamic cube designer will automatically make the mappings for you. And if I look at the rest of them, you can see the same thing, where it maps automatically maps the column values to the actual measures. Again, click on implementation, and it gives me a nice little ERD here of my tables involved. My measures again come out of cell stack, and then each of my dimension tables are listed here to correspond to my actual dimensions that are defined in my model. I'm going to hit save, and I've actually modeled my first cube. We have not actually built the cube. We have, just at this point, have just simply created a definition for that cube. Now we actually need to consume that cube. We want to release it to my users. So to do that, we're going to right-click on my cube, and we're going to select the option to publish. Very similar to Framework Manager in this case. So we're going to click Publish, and we're going to get a list of options when we publish our cube. Now, because it's a brand new cube, and we've not used this before in the, pa in, in the past, we're going to go ahead and select all the options. And I'm going to go through this real briefly. So one of the options is we've got to create a package. Like every other data source out there, every other object you have in your current environment, the, the, the object has to reside in some kind of framework or inside of some kind of package. You can open Framework Manager up and actually and import your dynamic cube into Framework Manager, if you so choose, um, with your other existing metadata. Or you can create a one-time package using the cube design. We're also going to go ahead and add that to our server. So in this case, I only have one server. If we did have multiple servers in our environment, we don't have to tell it exactly which 
server we want to allocate our our dynamic queue to. So for load balancing reasons, we'd want to be able to point to one dynamic or one excuse me, one specific BI server. And we're going to go ahead and start the queue. And then lastly, one of the most important things of all is we have to associate an account to the actual data source. So our data source, our queue itself is pulling data from the actual data warehouse, or in this case, the SQL server. It's going to use my, my physical log on credentials to access that SQL server to load my dynamic queue. And that's what this last box is on the right here. I'm going to hit OK. And if all goes well, it should publish my queue to Cognos BI. It will be called My Cells VC. And we should see a screen that says the queue is now start. It takes a second for initial load. It's publishing the definition of the queue to the content store, which we should be able to see here in a few seconds. Actually, there it is already. And it has acknowledged that the queue has been published and received. So here we're going to look and see if the queue is available. As we can see, there is my, my cell dynamic queue. And for some reason, it didn't automatically start, so we're going to take care of that real quickly. So again, we're clicking. We're on Cognos Administration, a Cognos BI Environment. We're on the Data Sources tab. And I'm going to click the drop down. We're going to hit Start. Okay. And simple enough, it's instantaneously available now. I want to point this out. My cube, my data is very small, but normally it's going to take a few minutes to load your cubes, especially with if you have large dimensions. So we can actually see how long it takes to load the cube by going to the um, drop down here. We can look at a few recent messages. We can see that it started and stopped, or excuse me, it started, it started executing at um, at 59 seconds and then finished within about a second later. So the initial time you load your cube, this is very important. When you first load your cube to your server. It's only going to cache your dimension values. I repeat that. It only caches the actual members in your dimension. The actual measures themselves are not going to be cached with dynamic views. That gets done later using a tool called Aggregate Advisor, which we're going to go over that in a few steps. I want to point that out again. When you load your queue for the very first time, it will only load the actual measure, the, excuse me, the dimension in the memory. The actual measures themselves will go back as an actual SQL query to your data warehouse. So if I look, I have a package out here that I published called MyCells DC. So we're going to go ahead and launch that just to prove out that it works. Again, simple dimensions. These are loaded into memory. And again, we see the hierarchy that correspond to my different dimensions here. Pulling our dimensions as such and pull in our basic measure. There we go. Okay, so we built our initial cube, we published it, and now it's ready for our users. Now, lastly, what we want to do is we actually want to go through and run the actual aggregate advisor. This is going to allow us to actually cache the measures for our cube in the memory. So First step is obviously to publish your queue to Cognos BI. And lastly, we're going to open up a tool called Dynamic Query Analyzer. A Dynamic Query Analyzer is not part of the actual Dynamic Queues itself. It already comes with your environment. But there is a subcomponent of Dynamic Query Analyzer called the Aggregate Advisor. The Aggregate Advisor is specifically made for Dynamic Queues, and it's used for loading data into Dynamic Queues. As you can see, we are in the Dynamic Query Analyzer. So we're going to Click the Run Aggregate Advisor button here. Simple enough. And it gives me a list of my dynamic cubes in place. As I can see, again, it's only going to show the dynamic cubes, so you're not going to see anything else. This is just for dynamic cubes. So we're going to take my cells DC, the cube that we just created, and hit Next. 
Now, here we have quite a few options for analyzing the dynamic cube and providing in-memory in -memory recommendations. Um, one of those is to look at just the cube structure. The cube structure basically is going to look at the cardinality of your data and recommend some very general overall caching. That's, some, that's the initial thing you're going to do when you first time you publish. And then second, we have the option to look at the workload information. Um, workload is true user audit information. So that's going to take time to build, but that's going to look at over time, it's going to actually look at the usage by your users, and it's going to decide basically if there's repetitive queries by your users. It's going to take that into consideration when it creates the actual in-memory uh, recommendation. So in this case, we don't have any workloads, so we're going to hit next, and it's going to tell us there's none there. So we're going to set the maximums here. Um, in this case, I really only need a you know, gig worth of in-memory. This is going to be basically only limited by the amount of RAM on your server. Um, if you have, you know, 60 gigs of RAM on your server, then you're more than welcome to increase this to a higher number. Um, also, we're going to set a run time of less than an hour. So this thing, a large data set, could run for quite a bit of time. So you can set certain thresholds here so that it will run continuously. In this case, I have a very small data set, so it's going to be very fast. So we're going to hit OK. Um, no workload because we haven't enabled that. That's fine. We have no user usage. It's a brand new cube, so we can't analyze that in this case. OK. Hit finish, and this should take instantaneous. <laughs> Get small data set. So again, it actually came out recommended, and it see that we have a recommendation of basically 0 0.009 megs worth of memory. More or less, all the data set from my cube is not going to be cached in memory. And if I look at this, it's going to cache everything, including my metrics. Okay. Now, I can publish this to my dynamic cube to my server. The first thing it's going to tell me is that we actually haven't allocated any, any memory for this. So we're going to see that error message in a second. So we're going to go ahead and publish this. So I'm publishing my, my recommendations. And it says, hey, you've got an estimation of about 0.9 megs, but you have set the maximum aggregate cache to be zero. So what we haven't done is we haven't changed the memory setting. That was one of the steps in our initial workflow. So we're going to go in and we're going to do that now. So we're going to go ahead and publish this in memory recommendation. But we're actually going to have to increase the memory option settings to take account of that. So again, these settings for memory are going to dic be dictated by the amount of RAM that's on your current BI server environment. So how do we do that? We're going to go down and launch progress administration. It's on again. going to go to my data store because, again, that's where the dynamic cubes reside. We're going to click down here because I'm on my server one, which is the only server available to me. We're going to come down to the actual properties of my, my new cube. And so we have a list of the, of the, some of the settings that we can change. So under the properties, we see a maximum size of my aggregate. So we're going to increase that to be 10 megs. Simple enough. This setting is going to be dictated by, again, by the amount of memory on your server in place. So again, we're going to hit OK, OK, and we're actually going to stop. We're going to stop my queue. We now we we'll stop the queue, and we published our in-memory recommendations. So now when I start my queue for the first time, it's going to load my dimensions in the memory, and it's also going to go ahead and load the actual measures themselves in the memory. So we hit restart, and if we go down to view recent messages, we can see that the queue was stopped at a, at a few minutes ago. And it started again executing. And then when it finished executing, loading the dimension values, it also went on ahead and loaded our actual aggregate in the memory. And OK. And now that is our successful versus implementation of a dynamic queue. Um, very simplistic, but again, I think it gets points across of how, how simple it is to build your dynamic queue. So a couple things to consider about dynamic cubes. Uh, some repetitive information here, but dynamic cubes are initially modeled using the thing called Cube Designer. It is very similar to Framework Manager, but Cube Designer does not leverage any metadata that exists in your current Framework Manager. So you have to model your cube from scratch. You also must have a good data mark as a source for your actual dynamic cube. Um, I think that's the, the biggest key of all. If you have a poorly designed data warehouse or you have, you're trying to use it against a transaction system, dynamic cubes is probably not going to work as well as you expect it to. Okay. Um, Aggregate advisor. 
that's an optional component here that, that people skip. I think that's most important. It optimizes your queue. It's going to make your cubes run faster, and it's going to give you uh, better response times for your users. Again, the aggregate advisor is going to recommend two things. It's going to recommend in-memory aggregation, which is loaded to your Cosmos BI server. It's going to reside in the actual RAM. And it's going to recommend database aggregate. Database aggregates are basically aggregate tables for your data warehouse. It's going to provide you SQL that you can then provide to your DBA for creating this table. Um, it's informational only. It does not create any database aggregates for you. It's just simply there for you as an information to give back to your DBA as far as creating, for creating those tables. The in-memory aggregates is the key. Those are the things that are going to actually get published back to Cosmos BI. Um, again, as we go through here, some of the things we just pointed out. Uh, it is recommended, again, you run aggregate advisor against your cube. You have to increase the memory settings before you publish your or restart your cube. If you're going to use the in-memory aggregation that comes out of the uh, dynamic query analyzer, specifically the aggregate advisor, you're going to want to increase those memory settings to match your environment. So again, these settings that are highlighted in red are going to be equivalent to how the amount of memory that's currently on your physical server. And again, just to point this out one last time, when the cube loads for the first time, only the dimension members are going to be cached, not the measure values. The measure values themselves are not cached unless you run the aggregate advisor first, which analyzes your cube and makes recommendations for in-memory aggregation. A couple of things about dynamic cubes to consider. Uh, it does not indicate that any other cube technology are going away. TM1 and PowerPlay are still here. Basically, dynamic cubes is a supplement to the existing Cognos BI solution. You cannot solve all your business problems with one cube technology. And I think one of the keys here that I should have mentioned early on, one of the highlights of dynamic cubes, there are no additional license requirements. And I'll say that again. You are not required to buy any additional licenses. If you don't already use cubes or you're looking at dynamic cubes for the first time, there's no additional purchasing. You simply deploy it into your existing environment using your existing physical servers. The only thing you have to download is the actual dynamic cube designer. And just a quick comparison of the different cube technologies that we have that Cognos offers. Uh, so when do you want to use different tools that, uh, that are all that tools that are provided by Cognos? TM1 is great if you're doing a lot of budget and planning. It's more, it's more um, geared towards if you need write back capabilities. Dynamic cubes are great if you have high volumes of data that have very low levels of detail. Again, you can put in such things as like the SKU, you can put in product number, um, UPC policy, and other things like that. Dynamic cubes are great for that. There is really no limitation on the size of a dynamic cube whatsoever, other than the physical memory that's on your server. Power cubes are great if you have low to medium data volumes, but you have really unstructured data sets. If you have a poorly designed data mark, power cubes are great for that. But again, power cubes have a, a size limitation issue. And then lastly is OLAP over relational, or what we used to call DMR. Basically, um, some of the pros for using the OLAP over relational is it's going to reside in Firework Manager, and it's going to use your existing metadata. The cons are that it does not provide really any in-memory aggregation or caching. So you should have a very small data set if you're going to use that. So when should you use the different tool sets, different, the different technology based on the data set? If you have simple list reports or static reports with very little interactivity, you can, you're going to schedule those reports. Build those against true relational. If you need to do what-if analysis with write-back capabilities, TM1 is the way to go. If you want self-service analysis against high performance, high performance over large volumes of data with lots of granular, levels of detail in OLAP, but you also have a data mark that's well structured, dynamic cubes. And again, DMR is great if you want to just use your existing environment manager model. And with that, I'm going to turn everything back over to uh, to Kristen and for our self-service jump start. Actually, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take this one up. Uh, thanks Michael, thanks very much. I uh, hope this was helpful guys. Um, one thing that we've we've put together to help you um, go down that path and investigate um, an experiment with a dynamic cube is we created a uh, a jump start, mostly focused on self service, but it could be for any type of um, application you guys would like to to evaluate if that dynamic cube would be the right you know the right solution or the right technology behind it. Um, we've we've created a, a jump start where we can sit with you guys. Kind of, kind of 
pick a case where you would like to empower your users in a self-service environment, or it could be, you know, it could be because you have some data set or data assets you'd like to deploy efficiently, and we're going to help you take that use case and and um, you know build it and deploy it using the, the you know the technology. Um, in a lot of cases, it's been uh, legacy Cogno shops who have uh, who were uh, interested into migrating um, maybe some cubes that they currently have, uh, whether it's in PowerPlay or TM1 or even DMRs, and they would like to investigate how do we, not replicate it, but how do we leverage dynamic cube to deploy the same assets. That's been an, a nice use case as well, a little more technical as a use case uh, than, than, than you know, interacting with the end users, but, but still could be very effective. So our goal is to help you pick the right platform, validate this platform, and make sure that you know, dynamic cube is a good investment of your time. Um, there's no license investment, so the issue could be, you know, do I really want to embrace this? And, um, and 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 sometimes the best approach is to take a, a use case or a pilot and prototype it. So we have this jump start, which could really help you uh, get things off the ground, and we could uh, share our experience, such as Michael's experience in the field, um, to make sure that we apply uh, the best practices and, and the right approach to to deploying this. So um, you know, feel free to reach back to us, um, you know, via an email. Uh, you'll be contacted by our by our marketing team on following up on this uh, on this webinar. And uh, if you are interested in just jumpstart, I mean, the duration of the jumpstart could vary based on the use case. Um, there's really uh, many different flavors of it, but feel free to reach back to us, and we'd like to uh, we'd like to uh, you know help you um, with this deployment. So, Kristen, I'll leave it back to you. Thanks, Francois, and thanks, Mike. That was a great presentation. Um, so we've actually had a, a handful of questions come through. Um, so I'm just going to kind of uh, read them off, and um, Francois and Mike, you can answer as they apply. Um, so somebody had wrote, uh, written, memory is dictated by server memory. It is not linked or hosted to by the query service JVM memory settings. Is it separate from JVM memory settings? I don't know. There, it's a combination of both. So there's actually, we, I didn't get too much of details, but there are two memory settings. The, the JVM memory settings do dictate the um, caching of the dimensions themselves. So when you load your queue the first time, it's going to load those dimensions in the cache. That's actually going to use your JVM memory settings. When you actually do the optional piece of it, which is the aggregate advisor, which is loading the, the facts or the measures in the cache, that's actually going to be set differently. That's the aggregate, um, maximum max aggregate limit that we saw earlier. OK. Um, do you have to run the aggregate advisor every time the cube is rebuilt? No. It, it's not every time it's rebuilt. If the aggregate advisor creates the initial recommendations and it loads that every time it's restarted, but if the cube structure doesn't change, then you don't have to rerun that aggregate advisor. If you add a new dimension or add new measures, obviously the structure has now changed. It, the, Existing recommendations are not going to be valid, so you do have to run it there. But you know, if you're just restarting and refreshing your queue, the aggregate advisor is not used at that point. It's going to use what's already published. If you want the cube to be published with the Cogno service account credentials, then do you have to model it while logged in with those credentials or log back in with them just to publish? Um, the easiest way is to log in with those credentials, but you can actually go into the data source connections. Um, that's not the data store tab. That's a different tab under the normal database connections. And in there, there's a, a, a property of the data source for that dynamic queue. There's an option in there that allows you to change that to a different account. So we didn't go through that, but basically that's one of the few things you can change about the data source connection. Can PowerPlay Studio access dynamic cubes? No. That That is the one studio that cannot. But PowerPlay Studio is only geared towards PowerPlay. It is always going to ever just use PowerPlay cubes. In this case, now CEO Workspace Advance is, is, are the tools that are going to most commonly be used for these cubes or in Report Studio also. Okay. Um, when do you specify credentials for database, data source, and cube designer? What is the purpose of the initial login prompt that the cube designer presents when you first open a model? Um, just like any other data source, you, when you log on, you have to verify that you have access to those databases. So if you're in a, 
a multi-tenant environment or, or multi-user um, environment, you need to have access to those data sources. Usually as an admin, you're going to have access to everything, but not always the case. So you do have the capabilities of actually um, allowing individual users to create dynamic queues and publish those. But again, that's all based on security. But basically, when you log on to Cognos BI um, through Dynamic Queue Designer, it's accessing the existing data source connections that are available to you. Okay. How do you allocate memory to each package? A server has X amount of memory, and how do we distribute memory across different packages that we deploy? Right. So you don't really allocate memory by the package. You allocate it by the queue. Um, and, and under the data store, section that we were initially in where we stopped and start the queue. If you notice, it's attached to one physical dispatch server. If you have multiple dispatchers, you actually have to allocate and route that dynamic queue that dispatcher. You have to tell it. In this case, we only had one, so it was very simplistic, but you'll actually allocate your dynamic queue to a physical dispatch server, and in there, you would actually set the memory at the, at the queue level. So if your queue resides in four or five different packages, that's really relevant. It's really about setting the memory for the dynamic cube itself at the center of the spectrum level. Is dynamic cubes the next generation of DMR? I mean, you can think of it that way. It's really not built on top of DMR. I, I, I kind of refer to it in that fashion. It is kind of very similar to DMR in that aspect, where it's actually now it's in memory, but it's a lot more than that. There's a lot more capability to dynamic cubes, which we didn't talk about, such as virtual cubes and being able to leverage aggregate tables and things like that. But it's similar in nature to DMR, um, where, where you model, you take your metadata, and you're going to model that in a, uh, in a in design tool. Okay, is there a capability to combine multiple dynamic cubes in Framework Manager package? Yes, yeah, Framework Manager. You you we you can publish the, the packages directly from Cube Designer, or you can simply open up Framework Manager and import all your dynamic cubes into one package. So if you want one package that has multiple cubes and, let's say, relational data sources, you would just simply run your metadata wizard in Framework Manager. You would see a list of all your data source connections. One of those would be the that dynamic cube, and you, know, you would import those into uh, into your Framework Manager package, just like any other OLAP, um, TM1 or uh, PowerPoint cube. Um, can a cube be put on a multiple dispatcher? It can. It, the cubes can be attached to multiple dispatchers. Um, one thing it will not do is it will not share cache between the dispatchers. Um, you just can't share RAM across two physical servers. This is not possible. But you can attach a cube to multiple dispatchers. Um, and then in that case, there will be some load balancing that happens at that point. If you're using the aggregate advisor, when you publish your aggregate, uh, your in-memory aggregation, it will publish it to both dispatchers. And so both those will load um, simultaneously. Okay. Is the dynamic cube stored on a file system like Transformer Cube? If so, what is the extension? It is not. So you create a dynamic cube model that is simply just a model of what your dynamic cube should look like. When you publish that model, it is published to the Cognos Content Store. So the definition is is really published as um, I don't know exactly how what it you know, stored is, but it's stored in the actual database. So whatever your content store is, the Oracle SQL Server. That's where your dynamic cube is going to be published. Kind of similar to a package of framework, where you model your, you create a pack or create a model in framework, but you actually publish a package to the content store itself. So, so run with physical files, other than the model. Okay, and we have one um, last question, just so we don't keep everybody past three o'clock. Um, somebody had asked. Right now, I have TM1 processes that build dimensions and load cube data from our data mark build files. Is this build load now automated with dynamic cubes? And if so, is that done during the stop start of the dynamic cube? All right, let me try to answer that. Uh, if you're looking for like the TI capabilities, turbo integrated pro uh, capabilities of TM1, you don't have that. Um, it's Again, it's when you build your dynamic cube, you should be loading that off of an existing data mark. So there is no really need to manipulate the data going in. Um, now, when you do start your queue, it does load your dimensions in the memory at that point. There are some um, some some uh, schedules you can create as far as refreshing the queue. So we didn't get into that, but in the Cognos administration screen on Cognos BI, um, there is a task you can create a maintenance task that allows you to refresh your data cache and also your dimension values. So if you refresh your data warehouse on a daily basis, you obviously can schedule a refresh every dynamic queue at that point also. And all that will be managed 
to your Cognos BI environment. No additional scripts or scheduling tools needed. All right, great. Thanks, Mike. Um, so we're just coming up over the hour now. Um, any unanswered questions, we will circulate to the team and somebody will uh, get back to you. Any additional questions, please feel free to um, email myself, kbrown at ironsidegroup.com, um, or Mike or Francois, and we will be sure to get in touch with you. Um, again, thanks for joining, and we hope um, you join us for future webinars.